Okay, everybody, I think the majority of people who said they were going to be here are here, which is great. Um, it's eight o'clock now, so I think I'll just get started. So my name is Julie Hamilton Elliott. I'm one of the cardiologists from Northern Ireland Veterinary Specialists. And I just wanted to welcome you to the first of our series of uh, monthly webinars, which will be looking at a series of different topics. First of all, some cardiology topics, then some surgical topics, and then some topics from our advanced veterinary nurses who work at NIBS. So I hope it gives you a little bit of information and um, obviously something to learn from. And hopefully as well, it gives you an introduction to all of the various members of staff we have at NIVS and also a little look at the facilities that we can offer to you particularly if you would be um, a clinician who'd be referring to us. So my presentation is about moggy murmurs and the preclinical feline cardiomyopathies and why it's important to be investigating moggy murmurs. If I could get the presentation to work that would be great. So a little bit of an overview of the presentation. Um, first of all, I'm going to be discussing why feline murmurs are important. Then I'm going to be thinking about um, which of cats that we see in practice we should be investigating for their cardiac murmurs. And then I'm going to be going through some of the investigations that might be recommended for investigating of these murmurs. Finally, I'm going to talk about the different treatments which can be available for treating preclinical cardiomyopathies in cats. First of all, I just wanted to give a little bit of information about me because I think it's sometimes nice to know the clinicians that you're referring to. And we are a new centre in Northern Ireland and many of us have maybe not worked in Northern Ireland for um, a long time or if ever, like me. And so I graduated from the University of Liverpool in 2011. That's an embarrassing picture of me and my husband on the day we graduated. Um, I then spent about two years working in companion animal practice in England. Um, followed by um, starting my internship in the University of Liverpool in 2013, which I completed in 2014. I then started um, a cardiology residency again at the University of Liverpool in 2015. Um, which obviously wasn't very imaginative, but they wanted to take me back, which was nice. Um, I also completed my advanced um, certificate in small animal medicine in 2018. Um, and in 2018 onwards, I finished my residency, stayed on as a lecturer um, in veterinary cardiology at the University of Liverpool before joining NIVS late last year. Um, and it's really been nice to come home and um, be working at home, living at home, and um, also working with a lot of the referring vets in the local area as well. Um, I'm due to be sitting my specialist examinations in March next year as my exams were unfortunately cancelled due to COVID this year which hasn't been very nice but I hope that's a little bit of introduction about me and a little bit of my background and um, how I became a cardiologist. So what are cardiomyopathies? Cardiomyopathies are any structural or functional myocardial disorder. So the myocardium is the thickest um, area of the heart muscle wall and makes up the majority of the heart muscle. The most common cardiomyopathy in cats is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM. Cats tend to develop structural cardiomyopathies rather than functional um, cardiomyopathies. So the most common functional cardiomyopathy that you um, might expect to see would be DCM in dogs or dilated cardiomyopathy, but it's not something that we would commonly see in cats. The cause of cardiomyopathies in cats is often unknown, though we suspect that there's likely to be a genetic predisposition in some breeds, and particularly in Maine Coons and Ragdolls, where a specific mutation has been isolated in both breeds. But we'd be suspicious that there's likely to be a hereditary basis in many breeds, maybe if all breeds of cats. Feline cardiomyopathies can present in many forms, which can be a little bit frustrating um, for the general practitioner. The most challenging are those cats who present asymptomatic with nothing abnormal in physical exam because there's absolutely nothing to go on in these cats and it's likely that these cats are most likely to present at some point in heart failure or with a thromboembolic event than um, having ever had any detected abnormalities previously. We then have the cats who give you a little bit more to go on. So these are the cats who have no clinical signs but have a heart murmur. So at least you find something on physical examination that might imply that there's an underlying cardiomyopathy present. 
Some cats may have gallop rhythms or arrhythmias. It's important to remember that these are two different things. A gallop rhythm is not actually an arrhythmia, um, but I'll go on to talk about this a little bit later in the presentation. Both gallop rhythms and arrhythmias are very um, specific for underlying structural cardiac disease in cats. And um, some may present with just an arrhythmia or a gallop in the absence of any other um, cardiac murmur or any clinical signs. We then have the cats who present with um, adverse events as a result of their um, cardiomyopathy. I'm not entirely sure why my video has disappeared. Um, but hopefully you can still see me. Um, so we can have cats who present with congestive heart failure or those cats who present with aortic thromboembolism. Finally, we have cats who might just present with syncope as the only clinical sign. So these are less common than those who present with um, heart failure or fate events. Um, but sometimes syncope is the only sign of a cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, some cats may never have any clinical signs of their cardiomyopathy and sudden death is the, the only um, sign that they demonstrate. Obviously, at that point, it's too late. Um, but whenever we investigate feline murmurs, we're trying to get to a point where we can potentially predict and prepare an owner for this eventuality. The purpose of this presentation is to focus on these cats who are asymptomatic, so preclinical, um, but have a heart murmur. These are the cats that will present to you in clinic frequently for things like vaccination appointments or for pre-anesthetic checks. And quite often we're left in a situation where we have to decide which of these cats we're going to recommend recommendation or investigations for, particularly whenever those cats otherwise seem clinically well in themselves. So a little bit about the specifics of cardiac murmurs in cats, because they're a little bit different to dogs. Cardiac murmurs are anything um, that, that essentially, uh, cardiac murmurs are essentially caused by anything which causes high velocity blood flow within the heart or turbulent blood flow. So that can be caused by um, outflow tract obstructions, which we commonly see in cats with cardiomyopathies, or if there is any evidence of regurgitation, which we would commonly see, say, with mitral valve disease, um, which we do see in cats, maybe more frequently in dogs. So the presence of a cardiac murmur has to imply that there's some form of underlying structural disease within the heart in most cases. It's also important to remember that cats can commonly present with cardiomyopathies and have no cardiac murmur whatsoever. Um, but obviously we're here to, to talk about murmurs today. Murmur grading in cats is similar to dogs. We grade them from a grade one to a six out of six. Your grade one to two murmurs are those murmurs which are quieter than the heart sounds um, and easily localized. Grade three to four murmurs are those which are similar in um, intensity to the heart sounds or slightly louder and potentially radiate um, more widely than the lower grade heart murmurs. And then your grade five to grade six murmurs are those which are louder than heart sounds and radiate very widely um, across the chest and can maybe be heard on both sides of the chest. What differentiates a grade five and six murmur from a grade three or four murmur is the presence of a precordial thrill. So when you physically put your hands on the cat's chest, you'll be able to hear and um, actually physically feel um, a thrill present. It's not necessarily common to hear grade five or six heart murmurs in cats. They usually sit somewhere around the grade two, three, four, um, but th certainly they do occur and it's a good idea to always feel for a precordial thrill before you even put the stethoscope on their chest. Murmurs in cats tend to be localized more in the parasternal region. So in dogs, we often tell you to sort of listen to the lateral aspects of the chest wall and the apical and basilar regions. But in cats, sometimes you won't hear the murmur there. And this is just due to the specific anatomy of the, the cat and where the heart tends to sit in their chest. So when you're listening to a cat for a murmur, try to set the cat on top of your stethoscope um, in the sternal region, listening along the sternal borders. And that's when you're more, where you're more likely to actually hear their murmurs if they have them. It can sometimes be difficult to differentiate an apical, so a murmur, so a murmur which would be sitting just um, at the point of the elbow versus a basilar murmur, so those murmurs that sit more up in the armpit area in cats. And this is just due to their physical size. It's quite difficult to differentiate between um, both aspects of the heart um, in, a, in a tiny cat chest. If you can differentiate, that's great, but you would be forgiven for describing a murmur as either left or right parasternal rather than having to differentiate apical from basilar. 
It is important to listen to both sides of the chest, however, and it's possible that a cat can have a right parasternal murmur and absolutely no murmur on the left side of the chest. So do try to listen to both sides or you might miss something. Feline murmurs also have an, a tendency to wax and wane. So that means that sometimes your colleague might have listened to the cat a week ago and heard a very quiet grade two out of six murmur. And then you have the cat um, a week later for a different reason and the murmurs are grade four out of six. And this is because feline murmurs can sometimes change in intensity with heart rate. So whenever the heart rate is higher, the murmur becomes uh, louder. And when the heart rate is lower, the, heart, um, the murmur is quieter. And obviously if the cat is more stressed and it's been sitting in a busy waiting room for half an hour, the murmur could be louder than what it was a week ago whenever it was at home. We call this dynamic, so just a, a changing intensity of heart murmur with heart rate. And we often see it in relation to outflow tract obstruction. Um, we know that cats with HCM often have outflow tract obstruction. These are your hokum cats or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy cats. Sometimes we'll helpfully um, abbreviate this as DLVOTO uh, or dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. These sorts of dynamic murmurs can be physiological, so benign or pathological. And the important thing to remember is that you can't differentiate between a physiological or a pathological murmur on auscultation alone. But just because a heart murmur waxes and wanes doesn't necessarily mean it's significant. It's also important to remember that complete resolution of a cardiac murmur is usually not a good sign. So just because a heart murmur seems to have completely disappeared doesn't mean that suddenly the heart disease has disappeared. It usually implies that probably there's some underlying myocardial failure and that's why the murmur has actually got um, better rather than worse. A little bit on functional murmurs. As I said, these are pretty common in cats and they're often benign. They're usually low grade, so less than a grade three out of six, and you'll often hear them in the basal region if you are able to localize into that region. They usually reflect some form of mild outflow tract obstruction, and they often suggest that there is no, um, if you find a functional murmur, you usually find it in relation to a cat who doesn't have any significant structural cardiac disease. But we also hear functional murmurs when uh, in certain disease states. So if we have any changes in blood viscosity, um, such as in anemic cats or cats who have high output states, so your hyperthyroid cats, they can sometimes develop heart murmurs in the absence of any structural cardiac disease. And these murmurs can sometimes improve with treatment of the underlying condition. Pregnant cats can sometimes have um, physiological murmurs as well. Um, so if you hear that, say, prior to a spay, that that could be why the murmur's there and then it disappears afterwards. It's important to remember that feline murmurs are extremely common. So the CAT scan study, which was published in 2015, was a really nice study which looked at a group of healthy cats who had presented to rehoming centres. So it was a study which wasn't looking at a referral population and, and it's hopefully a better reflection of the sort of normal general feline population that you're more likely to see in general practice. The CAT scan study showed that the prevalence of heart murmurs in cats is roughly 40% and that increases to about 60% in cats who are over nine years of age. So roughly half of the cats that present to you in general practice are going to have cardiac murmurs. It's also important to remember that a large proportion of cardiac murmurs in cats are functional, which is the reason that I've discussed these functional or physiological benign murmurs. So in the CAT scan study, they showed that a good proportion of cats who had heart murmurs actually had no underlying cardiac disease. But it's important to remember that it's not possible to distinguish those cats who have functional murmurs from pathological murmurs on physical examination. So it's very difficult for you to tell the client in um, your consultation that the heart murmur um, is not significant to the cat. It's also important to remember that murmur grade does not necessarily reflect disease severity. Um, certainly a loud grade murmur might be more likely to suggest significant structural cardiac disease, but cats who develop myocardial failure can have an improvement or um, a downgrading of their murmur intensity because the actual heart function has, has, has um, worsened. So we can't necessarily um, really say very much about um, murmur grade in relation to underlying disease severity. And again, some cats with heart disease have no cardiac murmur present. So again, in the CAT scan study, there was a, a good proportion of cats who had no murmur um, and who actually, um, it, some cats had heart disease with no heart murmur and some cats had no murmur and um, had underlying heart disease. So which cats should we be investigating? Because you're probably thinking, well, if 
40% of cats, or to me almost 50% of cats who present to my clinic um, have a heart murmur, but roughly 70% of those cats don't have any structural cardiac disease. Which of these cats am I going to suggest that should be investigated further? Well, there are certain things, um, both in the physical history and on um, clinical examination, that might make you more likely to want to investigate those murmurs. I would definitely investigate a cardiac murmur if there was any prior history of episodic tachypnea or dyspnea. Um, so often clients will describe episodes of panting, particularly whenever the cat has been stressed um, or has been exercising, something like that. Those cats are more likely to have structural cardiac disease present. If a cat has had, any, uh, had a heart murmur and also any prior history of intermittent pain or lameness, this might reflect underlying thromboembolic events. Sometimes they can have transient thromboembolic events related to cardiac disease, which might cause intermittent pain, lameness, vocalizations, things like that. Obviously, I would try to exclude other causes of pain or lameness, um, such as musculoskeletal disease, but just bear it in mind if the cat has strange episodes and also a heart murmur present. Certainly any other unusual behaviour might reflect cardiac disease um, if there's a heart murmur present. I'll talk about it in the next slide, but we theorise that some cats might actually experience angina or chest pain related to their cardiac disease. So don't ignore this if you can't find any other cause for unusual behaviours. The presence of gallops or arrhythmias in physical examination are highly specific for cardiac disease in cats. Arrhythmias in dogs aren't always necessarily related to structural cardiac disease and can reflect systemic disease, but in cats they are quite specific for structural disease. So don't ignore gallops or arrhythmias, even if there's no heart murmur present, it's always worth investigating these cats for cardiac disease. Certainly if there's any prior history in the family of cardiac disease, if any siblings or if a mother or father has died of congestive heart failure or suspected thromboembolic event, I would recommend that all other cats in the family are screened, particularly if those cats have cardiac murmurs. And also bear in mind those predisposed breeds, your Maine Coons, um, Ragdolls, if they have a heart murmur, I would definitely recommend investigating those as well for HCM. But overall, there is absolutely nothing wrong with investigating any cardiac murmur. I would rather investigate a heart murmur and offer investigations to a client and find that it was functional than not recommend it and find the cat goes into heart failure a few years down the line and the owner wasn't prepared for that event. So if you investigate and I find nothing wrong, then don't worry about it, that's fine. Um, but obviously it depends on client finances and, and, and how sort of proactive they are and whether they actually want to investigate the cat. So as I said, I'll just want to, just want to talk about angina pain in cats because it's, some, it's something that we're sort of recognising more in feline um, cardiomyopathies. So feline cardiomyopathies are quite similar to human cardiomyopathies in some ways. We know that cats with HCM appear to um, have ischemic changes to the heart and therefore may experience similar changes to humans who have ischemic heart disease. Humans often experience angina pain or chest pain whenever they have ischemic events and we're starting to recognize this more in cats. So this little cat is called Ozzy and he presented to our neuro service in my previous hospital with these unusual events where he appeared agitated, um, painful, sometimes vocalizing and not responding to the owner. Um, he didn't appear to lose consciousness and they appeared to just resolve on their own. The neuro service found no reason to believe that these were seizure events and therefore um, referred him to our cardiology service where we diagnosed him with quite a severe cardiomyopathy. We theorised that maybe some of the behaviour he's demonstrating in this video was angina pain and as I said we do see this in other cats with structural cardiac disease as well. So if you have any cats who have this sort of behaviour and you can't find any other cause for it and there's a murmur present um, then it might be worth investigating that murmur. Gallop rhythms are always abnormal. So for those um, who maybe don't know what gallop rhythms are, essentially they are diastolic heart sounds. So heart sounds that we hear after the sort of lub dub um, of systole in the cardiac cycle. There's two different um, diastolic heart sounds, S3 and S4. Essentially, both are related to restrictive filling of the heart. So if there's anything that causes stiffening of the left ventricular walls, um, you can develop these um, diastolic heart sounds, which you can hear on physical examination. And they essentially sound like a, a galloping horse whenever you're listening to the chest. It can take a little while to get your ear into these, um, but the more you hear them then, and the more you'll get with them. 
gullet rhythms always signify underlying structural cardiac disease in cats and they can be present in the absence of a cardiac murmur so just the presence of a gallop rhythm should be enough for you to um, recommend and, and push for further investigations in these patients and always be suspicious of fancy cats with cardiac murmurs so we know that our main coons and our rag dolls are both genetically predisposed to HCM, so a heart murmur in these should always be investigated. But we also know that British short hairs and sphinxes are predisposed to HCM as well, though we haven't found an underlying mutation for that, and I would certainly recommend investigations of these. Also, just bear in mind that we know that domestic short hairs in general are predisposed to cardiomyopathies, so um, it's not necessarily isolated to just these fancy cats. So I'm going to move on to discuss how we could investigate preclinical heart murmurs in cats. First of all, preclinical murmurs are always worth investigating. The reasons for this is that first of all, investigating a heart murmur will help us differentiate whether um, it is a physiological murmur or a pathological murmur. And that obviously changes our decision making and what we're going to advise to the client. It also helps us with disease staging. Some cats with cardiomyopathies might be in the very early stages of their disease and not at any risk of developing heart failure or thromboembolic events, but some might be slightly later on and very much on the cusp of having one of those events. And so investigating will help us actually stage them and decide whether we need to advise the owner that the cat's at an increased risk of an adverse event. It also helps us pronosticate. So again, it helps us prep the owner for whether or not their cat's likely to die imminently if it's cardiomyopathy or whether maybe it will have a completely normal life and never experiencing any adverse events of the underlying structural disease. And it also helps us with treatment decision-making. So there are a few treatments that might be recommended in the preclinical phases of feline cardiomyopathies. And without doing investigations, we're not going to be able to offer those treatments to our clients and to our patients. Finally, it helps us with client training. If we have a cat that's on the cusp of, of developing a congestive heart failure, we can train the owner to do things like monitor um, resting respirates, which can hopefully help them pick up the early signs of heart failure earlier than they would have ordinarily and get the cat to the clinic um, before it's in fulminant heart failure. It might also um, train the owner to look for evidence of thromboembolic events or abnormal behaviours that might signify that we need to be giving some treatment to these cats. So which tests should we be offering to cats with um, preclinical murmurs? Well, we know that echocardiography is the gold standard for investigating structural disease in cats. The reason for this is that it helps us actually classify the underlying cardiomyopathy. We know that HCM is the most common cardiomyopathy, um, but there are other possible diseases that could be there. It also helps us with disease staging. And I'm going to discuss disease staging um, later on in the presentation, but there has been um, a new consensus statement published this year, which actually helps us stage um, preclinical cardiomyopathies in cats. And also ECHO will help us with treatment decision making. So whether we see some smoke present within the left atrium, that means that the cat's at an increased risk of thromboembolic events, and that would maybe push us to um, give um, antithrombotic treatment or whether there's a big left atrium, as we can see here, that maybe makes us more cautious about um, an imminent risk of heart failure and whether we should be preemptively giving owners frizomide home in case that event occurred in the home environment. Sometimes people are more confident in x-rays than echo and there is some benefit in x-rays. And, um, sorry, I'll just stop this. Um, and sometimes biomarkers are also useful in preclinical cardiomyopathies as well. If you do have a cat who has an arrhythmia or um, you're concerned that there has been some sort of syncopal event, then sometimes an ECG can be beneficial. Um, but an ECG on its own is not enough for investigating cardiomyopathies and it needs to be backed up with another modality such as echo x-rays or biomarkers. So I'm just going to quickly summarise the acquired feline cardiomyopathies and some of the echo images that you would see. I appreciate that not everybody is necessarily um, confident in echo, but I thought that it would be nice to share some images of something that I might see whenever I'm echoing these cats. So the most common feline cardiomyopathy, as we all know, is HCM or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A subtype of HCM is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or HOCOM. <laughs> 
We also have restrictive cardiomyopathies, RCM, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or ARVC, dilated cardiomyopathy, DCM, and the unclassified cardiomyopathies or UCM. And I'll hopefully be able to go through these one at a time and summarize some of the changes that we would see in echo with these cats. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM is the most common cardiomyopathy um, and its prevalence is roughly 14.7% in the population increasing with age, so roughly affecting one in six cats in the feline population. There are certain risk factors for cardiomyopathies um, or HCM, including being male, older cats, having a heart murmur of a grade three or over, and it's possible that cats who are overweight are more likely to have HCM, though this is less, um, it's not as well um, documented as the other factors. The gold standard for diagnosing HCM is ECHO and the way we diagnose this is by looking for evidence of left ventricular concentric hypertrophy. That hypertrophy has to be over six millimetres in diastole in, in thickness and it can affect um, all of the left ventricular walls or just one segment of the left ventricular walls. So this is a standard echo of a heart of the cat. Um, it's a right parasternal four chamber, well actually this is a five chamber view as it includes the aorta as well. So those who are unfamiliar with echo, this is the left atrium and the mitral valves. This is the left ventricle and we can actually see the aorta exiting and the left ventricle here and we call this the left ventricular outflow tract and we can just about see the right heart here. The right atrium is sort of squished at the top of the screen and the right ventricle is here. So in this case we can see that the left ventricular walls are generally quite thickened um, subjectively and if you measured those I suspect they would be more than six millimeters in diastole. The left atrium is also slightly dilated as well and um, we can see a little bit of smoke or a little bit of spontaneous like a contrast actually drifting from the left atrium into the left ventricle so this cat would be at an increased risk of thromboembolic events. It's important when we make a diagnosis of HCM that we um, exclude other causes of left ventricular concentric hypertrophy so we need to exclude other causes of um, increased left ventricular afterload. So if we have a cat that we diagnose with suspected HCM, we always perform systolic blood pressure to exclude systemic hypertension. And also in a cat of a certain age, usually cats more than eight years of age, we'll test them for hyperthyroidism with a TT4. Both systemic hypertension and, and it, um, hyperthyroidism can basically result in a heart that looks like HCM. And we should either exclude this and, and certainly treat it before we make a definitive diagnosis of HCM in these cats. Additionally, acromegaly has recently been shown to be a contributory factor to left ventricular um, concentric hypertrophy. And it was found in a study published in 2018 that cats of acromegaly have significantly thicker left ventricular walls than normal cats and even those cats with just diabetes and no acromegaly. So I'm not saying we should be running an IGF in every cat that comes in the door with HCM phenotype, but if you have any reason to believe that they fit any of the clinical features for acromegaly, then I would run that in addition to checking blood pressure and um, running a TT4. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or HOCAM is a subset of, of HCM. These are cats who have an HCM phenotype, so left ventricular concentric hypertrophy, but have some form of obstruction within the left ventricular outflow tract. So that's either due to some segmental thickening of the wall in that region, or sometimes due to the mitral valve actually being sucked up into the region, or sometimes a combination of both. The Hokum cats are those cats who are most likely pre to present with feline murmurs. So cats who don't have outflow tract obstruction with HCM are maybe more likely to be those who will have a silent cardiomyopathy until they finally present with heart failure or a thromboembolic event. And there are also these cats that are likely to present with these dynamic heart murmurs. The cause of the heart murmur in hookum cats is due to a pressure gradient across this obstructed region. So if the heart rate's increasing and the heart's pumping um, with more strength because of um, catecholamines and stress, the pressure gradient across this region will worsen and the heart murmur will get better, or get um, sort of louder. Um, but whenever the cat's less stressed and the heart rate is lower, um, the heart murmur might be slightly reduced in intensity. So these are your dynamic murmur cats. As I said, the cause for the heart murmur in Hukum cats is partly due to a septal bulge, so segmental thickening within the left ventricular outflow tract, and that results in an obstruction to the flow of blood as it leaves the left ventricle and tries to get out to the aorta. 
that a component of the obstruction is also related to this anterior um, leaflet of the mitral valve. Whenever we have obstruction across this region, the left at the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve can essentially be sucked into the outflow tract. And that results in obstruction of blood flow as it leaves the left heart, but also results in some mitral regurgitation. So as we can see in this echo, there is some turbulent blood flow um, of blood as it's leaving the left ventricle and going into the aorta, partly due to this segmental thickening, but also likely due to the fact that this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is being sucked into that area as well. But that's resulting in some insufficiency of the valve and this really nice um, mitral regurgitant jet, which is coursing towards the free wall of the left atrium. Mitral regurgitation might also contribute to the murmur in these cats, and um, but may also cause um, some left atrial remodeling in these animals as well. And this sort of sucking of the um, mitral um, valve leaflet into the LVOT is called systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve or SAM. So you'll often hear us talking about looking for evidence of SAM in cats of HCM or whether there's an absence of SAM. So if you ever see that in one of our echo reports, that's what we're referring to. Moving on to restrictive cardiomyopathy or RCM. This is rarely diagnosed preclinically, partly because these cats don't tend to present with cardiac murmurs, so they have a sort of silent cardiomyopathy present. And therefore, most of them present in heart failure, so 94% of them will come to your clinic already in failure. Obviously, this means the most common clinical sign in RCM cats is respiratory distress. They're also at a huge risk of thromboembolic events because they often have quite marked atrial remodeling and um, state of the bloods within the atrium, which predisposes them to developing thrombi. Cardiac death is common, which makes sense given that they are at a high risk of heart failure and thromboembolic events. And therefore the prognosis is guarded, although the survival time has been variably reported in the literature with some saying that cats don't live more than two months, although some reports find cats live a little bit longer, some over a year. The echo diagnosis of RCM is slightly different to HCM. So these cats tend to have um, normal left ventricular wall thickness, um, but they can also have quite dilated left ventricles. They can also have some remodeling of the right side of the heart as well. They tend to have quite marked atrial dilation and so often it affects both the right and the left atrium. And this is because these cats tend to have a restrictive filling pattern. So the ventricles are much um, stiffer than in HCM. And therefore this restrictive filling and this difficulty of filling of the ventricles results in quite marked atrial pressures and quite marked atrial remodeling. They also tend to have normal systolic function. Sometimes HCM cats in the end stages and can develop systolic dysfunction. ARVC or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is a little bit of a mouthful. It's an uncommon disease in cats, but it might be something that you are familiar with in dogs. So we commonly talk about ARVC in boxers, which is similar in its etiology, but slightly different in its presentation. Cats and dogs of ARVC um, develop fibrofatty infiltration of the right ventricular myocardium. So in these pathology images, we can see that these adipocytes essentially replace the myocardium of the right ventricle, and it results in marked thinning and dilation of the right ventricular walls. And we can see in image B how the right ventricle is massively dilated, thin-walled, um, particularly in comparison to the left ventricle, which has normal wall thickness and chamber size. And this um, top image A shows a light being shone through the right ventricular walls, and you can just see how thin um, this cat's right ventricular walls were. This, as I said, this fibro fatty infiltration results in right ventricular wall thickening or thinning and dilation. And as a result of these, this, these cats often have um, right ventricular myocardial failure and develop right sided congestive heart failure. So they'll have evidence of pleural effusion ascites, etc. In dogs of ARVC, they don't tend to develop this same cardiac remodeling and they're more likely to just have an arrhythmic form of the disease. Cats can um, have both the remodeling that we see here, but can also develop arrhythmias. Those arrhythmias can be ventricular, but they also develop conduction disturbances as well. And third degree AV block is not uncommonly reported in cats of ARVC. Prognosis of the disease is generally expected to be poor. Some cats do better than others, um, but they'll often present in heart failure rather than in the preclinical stages.
And this is an echo example of ARVC. So we can see in this heart that the left heart is dwarfed by the size of the right heart. The right ventricle is dilated and thin walled and the right um, atrium is absolutely massive. And these cats can sometimes develop thromboembolic events and this could potentially be a thrombus sitting within the right atrium here. We can also see that this cat has quite marked pleural effusion secondary to right um, sided heart failure. And it could be that this cat was experiencing third degree AV block looking at the ECG. DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy is a thankfully quite rare disease nowadays. Um, it was back in the 80s the most common heart disease in cats and um, the reason that it's declined so significantly is due to the fact that back at that time a group of pioneering veterinary cardiologists actually worked out that it was taurine deficiency that was causing DCM phenotype in cats and it was because the commercial pet food companies weren't supplementing the diets appropriately with taurine. Since then it's um, common knowledge that we should be giving cats touring in their diet as they can't assimilate it otherwise and um, therefore we don't see DCM so frequently though I feel that because there's more of a trend now for these natural um, diets um, I don't I'm not sure how um, many people have seen these but I have seen cats fed vegan diets um, and I just wonder whether or not we're more likely to see a DCM phenotype than we would have done a few years ago given this new um, craze for um, bespoke diets. These cats often present in congestive heart failure. They have a very similar phenotype to dogs with DCM, so quite marked left and right-sided cardiac remodeling, often with thin walls and left ventricles and systolic dysfunction. The prognosis is poor as the majority don't present until they're in heart failure and few will survive more than a month after diagnosis. Finally, we have our non-specific phenotypes or unclassified cardiomyopathies. And these are essentially any cat with a cardiomyopathy with echocardiographic features that don't fit into any specific disease entity. And we wonder if um, UCM cats are potentially um, part of a spectrum of cardiomyopathies that we'll see in cats and whether the HCM and RCM are all, all in one spectrum and UCM is some sort of transitionary phase between these two diseases. That's certainly out for debate. We uncommonly see cats with UCM and we usually can fit them into one category, but it's just worth knowing what these are if you ever see it written in the literature. So what's changed recently with feline cardiomyopathies is that there are now recommendations that we should be staging um, our, our cardiomyopathies. And this is based on the ACFIN consensus statement for um, diagnosis, treatment and management of cardiomyopathies, which was published in April of this year. So they broke the feline cardiomyopathy um, into similar stages that has already been um, set out for mitral valve disease and which many of you are probably already quite familiar with. So we have our stage A cats. So these are cats that are predisposed to cardiomyopathies but don't have any remodeling yet. We then have two stages of preclinical cardiomyopathies in cats. So these are your stage B1 who are at low risk of developing adverse events such as heart failure and thromboembolic events. And then your B2 cats who are at a higher risk of developing thromboembolic or events or heart failure. And I'm gonna go into those stages in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. Then we have stage C cats. So these are cats who have um, either um, recently developed heart failure or had a thromboembolic event or have had a previous event. And then we have cats here in stage D who are in refractory congestive heart failure. So quite similar to the mitral valve disease staging that you're hopefully already familiar with. It's important to remember that cats can't be downstaged. So if you have developed heart failure, you can never go backwards into the preclinical phases. You're always in the stage C or D, even if your clinical signs have been controlled. Obviously my presentation is looking specifically at the preclinical phases. So I'm gonna be looking at stage B1 and B2 in, in the upcoming slides. And these are the cats who have a cardiomyopathy, so have structural cardiac disease, but don't have any clinical signs of that disease. So we, our stage A cats are those cats who are born predisposed to cardiomyopathies. So they don't have any evidence of myocardial disease, but they might have some sort of genetic predisposition to developing a myocardial disease in the future. This includes our Maine Coons, Ragdolls, British Shorthairs, but to be honest, you could arguably include any domestic shorthair in that group because we know that um, cats in general are predisposed to wild type HCM. The stage B1 cats are those who have presence of a cardiomyopathy, so they have some um, abnormalities of the left ventricular walls. In HCM, obviously, that would be left ventricular wall thickening. 
but they are at a low risk of developing imminent congestive heart failure or aortic thromboembolism. And we base this low risk on the presence of a normal left atrium or a left atrium with only mild dilation. The most common way to define the presence of left atrial dilation is with the LA to AO view, so left atrium to aortic ratio. This is a um, short axis view of the heart at the level of the aortic root. So you can just about see the Mercedes-Benz sign in the middle, which represents the aortic cusps. And then below it, we have this little comma shape, which is the left atrium. So a normal ratio between the aortic root and the left atrium is less than 1.5. So if you can fit less than 1.5 of your aortic roots into this space, then probably the left atrium is normal in size. So this is what we're, we're sort of basing our left atrial dimensions on. These cats tend to have normal left atrium and left ventricular function as well. Um, defining left atrial and left ventricular function requires a little bit more advanced cardiological skills in terms of echo, um, but you, most people should, with practice, be able to actually perform an LA to AO view. The stage B2 cats are those cats who have presence of a cardiomyopathy, have no clinical signs of an adverse event such as heart failure or a thromboembolic event, but are at, are at a higher risk of developing those events in future. And again, we base this on the presence of left atrial enlargement. So in comparison to our previous um, slide, we can see now that there's a much larger left atrium present, and probably we could fit more than two of our aortic roots into this space. So if we compare again to the previous slide, there's a big difference between these two cats, but they are both preclinical. So that's why it's important to be considering staging these animals. Stage B1 cats may never develop heart failure, but stage B2 cats are maybe at an Im imminent risk of doing so and require more um, close monitoring. There are also some additional factors which would put a cat in the stage B2 group. So those are cats who have gallop rhythms or arrhythmias, cats who have reduced left atrial function or reduced left ventricular systolic function, cats who have extreme left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is defined as cats who have left ventricular thickening more than nine millimeters in dimension. And certainly those cats who have presence of um, smoke or thrombus within the left atrium, which obviously it puts you at an imminent risk of developing aortic thromboembolism at some point. So I've talked a lot about echo and I appreciate that many people um, might not necessarily be confident in echoing or have a lot of experience in it. So you'll often be questioning what should I be doing if I have a cat with cardiac murmur um, but I don't have any access to echo or the owner doesn't want to, to go ahead with any referral or echocardiography. But we do have access to cardiac biomarkers and there are obviously the two most important ones are ProBMP and troponin I. I'll first talk about ProBMP. This is a compound which is um, released from the cardiac myocardium when there is any evidence of structural cardiac disease, usually in relation to atrial stretch, which is something that we'll commonly see in cats who have cardiac remodeling. The levels are seen to increase with um, ongoing structural remodeling, but it's important to remember that ProBMP can be elevated by other systemic diseases. So we can see it in cats who have renal disease and hyperthyroidism, um, cats who have systemic hypertension, for instance. So always consider the, the um, importance of an elevated pro-BMP in the context of other comorbidities in that cat. There are two different ways of running ProBMP, a quantitative way, which obviously involves taking the sample, sending it off to the lab and getting a quantitative value back. And then we have the point of care SNAP test, um, which is produced by IDEX and something that you can have in the clinic and use immediately whenever a cat visits you. The quantitative assay can be used both on um, plasma, but also pleural effusion with good sensitivity and specificity, whereas the point of care test can only be used accurately on plasma. Both tests are most useful when being used to differentiate cardiac from non-cardiac dyspnea. So if you have a cat who comes to the clinic who's dyspneic, there might not be a cardiac murmur present or there is a heart murmur present, um, but you're not quite sure whether or not this is maybe um, heart failure on its own or respiratory disease and a heart failure, you can um, perform this test and if it's high then you can be fairly happy that the cat has significant structural cardiac disease present. <laughs> 
Where the test isn't necessarily beneficial is when we have a cat with early structural remodeling. So this test may potentially miss early remodeling, particularly your stage B1 cats who don't have any significant left atrial dilation. Um, so just bear in mind that a normal pro-BMP test doesn't necessarily imply the cat is completely normal cardiac wise, but a high pro-BMP test, you can be pretty confident there is structural cardiac disease present. Troponin I is a compound which is released from the heart whenever there's cardiomyocyte injury. So it's not necessarily related to um, stretch of the chambers, but if there has been any insult to the myocardium, where, where is that um, structural cardiac disease or say an ischemic injury, the troponin level might be high. It's specific to the heart, um, but sometimes it can not necessarily be related to structural cardiac disease. It can be elevated by other diseases in the body. Again, things like renal disease, hyperthyroidism. We tend to see increased levels when there's remodeling or whether there's been an ischemic event. Several studies have shown that troponin levels increase linearly with the um, development of structural cardiac disease in cats, and also that it has some prognostic value. So high troponin I levels imply an increased risk of cardiac death. And there's some papers that I've included below if anybody would be interested in looking those up. Remember again that troponin can be completely normal in the early stages of the disease. So your B1 cats might have a completely normal troponin. So considering all this information, are biomarkers useful in preclinical cardiomyopathies in cats? Well, they are useful in that they can prognosticate. So high levels would imply that the cat is at some risk of developing um, adverse events or cardiac death in the future. And it can reveal cats who have severe remodeling. And um, so if you have a cat with a heart murmur, but seems completely fine and you run these tests and the levels are high, then it might imply that there probably is some sort of underlying remodeling present and that maybe an echo should be followed up on. And that might help push a client towards further investigations if they weren't already interested in doing so. However, you might miss cats with early disease and a normal either pro-BNP or troponin result does not imply that there's no structural cardiac disease present. And therefore you can't really use these tests accurately for screening. They're much more beneficial whenever we have a cat who is symptomatic for the disease, which isn't necessarily the point of this presentation. Many people are more confident in performing and interpreting thoracic x-ray than they maybe are with thoracic ultrasound. And so some may perform x-rays for screening for cardiomyopathies in cats. It's important to remember that x-rays are unlikely to provide any additional information in early cardiac remodeling. And a cat with early remodeling, so your B1 or maybe your early B2 cats, um, might have a completely normal um, cardiac silhouette on x-ray. It also obviously requires sedation to perform diagnostic x-rays, which might not be something that the client wants to go ahead with and obviously requires a bit more cost and um, is, is quite time consuming as well. And the classic Valentine heart, um, as we can see on this DV x-ray of a cat's chest, so you've got this sort of um, wider, um, wider sort of, um, heart base with this sort of narrower apical region. We used to say it had a very high association with HCM, but actually now there's several papers that have shown the association of the Valentine heart with HCM is fairly low. And all it really tells us is there, there is left atrial dilation. It's not very specific for um, to an underlying cardiac disease, all it tells you is that there might be some remodeling. And as I said before, the x-rays um, can potentially miss early cardiac remodeling. So you can't say for sure that a heart murmur is significant or not if the heart looks normal on x-ray. So moving on to treatments that we might be able to give for our preclinical cats um, with cardiomyopathies. One of the most common treatments that we'll prescribe to preclinical cardiomyopathies in cats is atenolol. Atenolol is a beta blocker and beta blockers both reduce heart rate and also reduce the ionotropy of the heart or the pumping ability of the heart. So theoretically, it makes sense to administer them to cats with obstructive cardiomyopathy. So our cats who have dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, so our Hocum cats, because if you reduce the heart rate and reduce the ionotropy of the heart, you reduce the pressure gradient across the region and theoretically maybe um, reduce the amount of remodeling that's going on.
Um, however, there's absolutely no evidence to support that atemlol actually improves survival time in cats with preclinical cardiomyopathies. A study published in 2013 showed that um, the effective treatment of atemlol on five-year survival in preclinical cardiomyopathies um, was basically no effect. There was no improvement in survival time in these cats. We used to sort of back ourselves up by saying, well, at least atenolol might be beneficial in improving quality of life in these cats. So thinking back to our cats of angina, just because we don't necessarily improve survival, do we potentially reduce the um, um, development of ischemic events in these cats and just generally make them feel better? Until recently, that was one of the ways that we justified the treatment. However, a very recent study published only this month in JBC has shown that giving a tenolol to cats with preclinical HCM didn't appear to improve quality of life or activity levels um, based on the owner's perception of that. Neither did it appear to improve um, values of cardiac biomarkers. So that kind of scuppers that justification for giving a tenolol in this case. It's also important to remember that atenolol um, can potentially push a cat into heart failure. Because it has this negative allotropic effect, you can worsen myocardial function in a cat who maybe is already struggling and essentially push them into heart failure. So if we have a stage B2 cat, we might not want to give that cat atenolol. If we have a stage B1 cat with significant outflow tract obstruction, maybe we would consider it. So therefore, I would suggest that we shouldn't be prescribing a tenolol without first having access to ECHO and knowing how imminent that cat's risk of developing heart failure is. And we also need to consider the um, evidence base versus the um, risk that a client won't actually be able to comply with treatment administration. We know that cats are difficult to medicate. We know that owners struggle with medicating cats. So do we really want to be giving an owner a medication that they have to give twice a day that maybe has absolutely no benefit to that cat and potentially might push it into heart failure? And particularly if that cat might need heart failure treatments in the future and the cat and the owner then become phobic of, of having to administer medication. So think very carefully about that whenever we are prescribing this treatment to cats. RAS inhibition seems like a good idea in cats who have cardiac remodeling. So if we think back to our physiology days, the RAS system or the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is stimulated in animals who have cardiac remodeling, particularly those who have heart failure. And there is some theoretical benefit in inhibiting rats RAS in cats with cardiac remodeling because if you reduce angiotensin and aldosterone, which have direct effects on causing remodeling, maybe um, that might sort of cause some reverse remodeling or at least slow the progression of the disease. However, again, there's absolutely no evidence that ACE inhibitors, so RAS inhibitors, are beneficial in cats with preclinical cardiomyopathies. Ramapril has been looked at specifically in a colony of Maine Coon cats with preclinical HCM. They find that although it reduced circulating renin, so it does appear to suppress RAS, there was no evidence that it actually improved cardiac mass or reversed any remodeling in these animals. Additionally, spironolactone, which is a diuretic but has anti aldosterone effect, has been shown in the same colony of Maine Coon cats not to actually result in any reverse remodeling or improvement of diastolic function. So although it seems like a good idea, again, there's no evidence for their benefits and we need to be thinking about um, the risk that a client might not be able to cope with administrating this medication to their cats. One treatment which might be beneficial in cats who are remodeling is clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is an antiplatelet drug, so obviously the aim is that we reduce thromboembolic events in these cats by giving it. We know that clopidogrel has been found um, to reduce the risk of repeat thromboembolic events in cats who have pre previously experienced that event. And we know that clopidogrel is superior to aspirin in this context. And that was based on the fat cat study, which hopefully all of you are aware of. What we don't know is if clopidogrel definitively reduces the risk of a primary event, but I think we're fairly safe to extrapolate from the fat cat study. And it's not a treatment that tends to cause any adverse effects in cats. We generally strongly advise that if there is a big left atrium present or if we see any evidence of spontaneous like a contrast or certainly if we see evidence of a thrombus in a cat with preclinical cardiomyopathy that we start clopidogrel and this has recently been supported by the New York Consensus Statement. 
They've also suggested that if we have a cat who has um, a left atrium to aortic ratio of over 1.7 or an LA maximum um, diameter of 16 millimetres that we start um, thromboembolic treatment in, in these cats. And this is an example of a cat with quite nice and um, spontaneous like a contrast or smoke. This is the left ventricle here and this is the left atrium with the left auricular appendage and we can see lots of nice smoke whirling around in that region. Remember just practically that clopidogrel tastes horrible. Cats really hate the taste of it. And if you're going to advise that it's ministered to one of your patients that you either try to disguise it in nice food or it's hidden within a gelatin capsule. So considering all this information, which cats should we be treating in the preclinical phases of their disease? Given that there's no convincing evidence that any treatment actually affects progression or outcome, you might um, think, well, actually, should, I don't really want to be treating any of these cats at all. And that's perfectly reasonable, particularly if the owner doesn't want to medicate the cat um, or if they struggle medicating the cat. Um, but it's certainly worth um, giving the owner the option, particularly for a thromboembolic treatment. Remember again the practicalities of trying to pill cats and owners genuinely do struggle with this and I think if you're going to recommend um, medications to cats just ask the owner if they're okay with that and if they do struggle to medicate maybe ask um, one of your lovely veterinary nurses to take some time to teach them to do that if you haven't got the time to do so and keep in communication with them and just find out if they are struggling because sometimes they don't want to tell you. Also consider whether or not congestive heart failure or a thromboembolic event is imminent, because that might change your treatment decision making. If a thromboembolic event appears to be imminent, you might be more likely to give clopidogrel. So if a cat is in the B2 stage, maybe clopidogrel will be more sensible than in the B1 stage. If you think a cat's at imminent risk of developing heart failure, you might not want to give that tenolol, and you might be more inclined to ask an owner to monitor resting respiratory rates and in fact send them home with a supply of furosemide, which they can use if the cat develops signs of early heart failure at home. So I think this new staging system does help us in our treatment decision making because if we have a cat in the B1 stage who is not at an imminent risk of any adverse event, you might be less likely to medicate them and maybe keep a close eye on them and see when they progress to the B2 stage, in which case treatments might, treatment decision making might change. The current recommendations for stage B1 cats is that we don't necessarily treat them but we monitor them for evidence of progressive left atrial dilation and the recommendation is that we see these cats annually with repeat echocardiography performed each year. The one exception might be those cats with dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and I've been through the pros and cons of medicating these cats of atenolol. Some cardiologists are more pro atenolol than others um, and therefore it's really up to their individual decision making but that might be the one exception to treating these cats. Stage B2 cats are those cats who do have left atrial dilation, might be at risk of developing thrombi, and therefore the consensus statement says that we should be giving these cats clopidogrel. We should also be monitoring these cats more closely for disease progression, so maybe seeing them more frequently for repeat echo, maybe every three to six months than every year. And at this stage, we should be training our owners to check the sleeping respiratory rates. A normal sleeping respiratory rate in cats has been shown to be less than 30 breaths per minute. So if we can train an owner to look for what is normal for their cat, they might be more likely to notice an increasing trend and more likely to get the cat to the clinic sooner if they notice that maybe the cat is more tachypneic than usual. You can download some apps for your phone. The Cardalis app is a really nice one which the owner can use to monitor resting respiratory rate and actually record and even send to the clinic so you can look at increasing trends. So that's the end of my presentation and just to summarise the major points. Heart murmurs are extremely common in cats and many of those heart murmurs are functional. However, the significance of heart murmurs can't be determined on auscultation alone. So we should always be at least recommending further investigations to owners who um, have a cat with a heart murmur, even if the owner doesn't want to head, go ahead with that or not. There are certain things that might make a heart murmur more significant and maybe help you push towards further investigations more than in other cases. The recommendations for investigation and management of feline cardiomyopathies has recently been updated. As I said, this has all been summarised in the ACFM consensus statement, which is open access and you'll be able to find it in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine. ECHO is unfortunately the gold standard for diagnosis of cardiomyopathies and there's not much you can necessarily do without ECHO to fully stage this disease. 
biomarkers are useful, particularly in those cats who have significant remodeling, but they're not very useful for cats in the early disease and aren't necessarily recommended for disease screening. I just wanted to thank you all for attending the first of our monthly presentations and I hope you've enjoyed this and find it informative. Um, I just wanted to again introduce yourself to, yourselves to me, um, I'm Julie, and this is my colleague Julie Kavanagh who's also a cardiologist at NIVS and she will be giving a presentation next month on um, preclinical um, cardiomyopathies in dogs. Um, if you would like to speak to us or you would even like to refer any cases to us, you can contact us at info at nivetspecialist.co.uk we are found just outside of Hillsborough, which is not far from Lisburn, just off the A1, which is pretty convenient. This is our address if you would like to find us. And finally, um, myself, Julie Kavner, and a cardiologist from Chestergate in England called Liz Bode are involved in the Vet Oracle Telecardiology Service. So we are happy to provide um, clinical advice to you, look at your ECGs, echoes, biomarker results, and we also offer a 24-hour halter service should that be um, useful for your arrhythmia patients. And if you would ever like to contact us about our services at Vet Oracle, this is our email address. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'd welcome all of you to um, ask any questions um, in the Q&A box. I've already received two questions which I can answer now, but if anybody else has any additional questions, just feel free to submit them and I will go through them one at a time. So um, Michael has said, that he's had a few cats suffer fate events a short time after anaesthetic and is there anything that you can do to minimize this risk if you know a cat is at risk um, i suppose i've not seen many cats necessarily develop thromboembolic events just generally related to ga i suppose it could be somehow related to reduced left atrial function um, and i don't really know how changing your anaesthetic protocol would necessarily avoid that but I suppose I would in general um, not use drugs that would be seen to reduce left ventricular systolic function and I would probably try to avoid drugs that reduce blood pressure such as um, ACP and things like that. And I suppose the main thing to remember is sometimes cats can develop fit events not necessarily due to the anaesthetic but maybe due to the surgery or there's any um, if, for instance, the cat has any neoplastic, neoplastic disease or anything like that, they might be more likely to develop a thromboembolic event that isn't related to the heart. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how that could be related specifically to GA, but if you have a cat that you think might have a cardiomyopathy pre-GA, I would definitely recommend investigating it and starting on thromboembolic treatments prior to the anaesthetic. And Sarah has asked what positioning she would use for screening feline echoes. Would you perform them in lateral on the scanning table or otherwise? I think ideally, um, from my perspective and the way that I've been trained, we should be performing echoes in, in lateral recumbency. It's just the best way to get the best quality images. In saying that, some people are trained in echocardiography in the standing position, so it very much depends on the individual centre where you were trained. If you have a dyspneic cat, then I would always recommend echoing in the standing position because putting them on their side can be particularly stressful. If you have a cat who is otherwise preclinical and perfectly happy otherwise, but just doesn't like lying on their side, sometimes we'll give them a little bit of butorphanol, so 0.2 to 0.3 mg per kg IM, which makes um, handling a little easier. And I also get great results from giving cats gabapentin prior to the um, visit to the clinic. And I think that greatly reduces their anxiety which might help with right lateral um, recumbency. Does anybody else have any, any other questions? I'll give you a second or two to submit them into the Q&A box and if not um, I'll end tonight's presentation. Oh we have one more question. Um, in the case of transient ATE which limbs do they usually involve? It's a really good question so they can potentially involve any limb and the classic AT presentation involves the hind limbs, your saddle thrombus, and those are pretty devastating and they're the cats who present to your clinic in horrible pain and um, completely non-ambulatory. But the cats who develop transient ATE, they often have involvement of the forelimbs and due to the specific anatomy of the um, great vessels that they leave the heart, it tends to be the right forelimb which more is more commonly affected by transient ATE and these cats um, they tend to present usually with sort of knuckling of the right forelimb that um, it doesn't appear to be particularly painful and just gets better on its own so yeah if you have a cat with sort of weird right limb forelimb limbness that sort of tends to come and go that might be more likely to be a transient aortic thromboembolic event.
Any more questions? I'll give you a second or two. So Craig says, what is the significance of tachycardia in your decision making in preclinical disease? And are you more likely to dispense beta blockers? So I guess tachycardia in cats is quite difficult to interpret sometimes because many cats are tachycardic when they visit the clinic due to stress. And what you need to decide is whether that, that tachycardia reflects sinus tachycardia, which you're maybe less likely to want to treat or probably very unlikely to want to treat um, because it's probably physiological or um, whether or not it actually implies a pathological tachycardia like a supraventricular tachycardia. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is in your ability to slow down the rhythm and see if you can actually pick out P waves um, related to your QRS complexes that would imply that this is sinus. So if I was worried about a tachycardia in a cat in my clinic, I would be more likely to try to perform an ECG first of all to classify what that rhythm is. You could try to perform vehicle maneuvers, so putting pressure on um, the bridge of their nose is sometimes a really good way um, to try and reduce their heart rate. So firm pressure up the bridge of their nose sometimes reduces the heart rate. Or you can apply sort of firm but gentle ocular pressure which is a vagal maneuver as well if you can slow the heart rate down and it seems like it's sinus then great you don't need to treat but if you think it's a pathological tachycardia i would be more likely to try and investigate it further with an ecg and even a 24-hour halter um, in a quiet environment before i would dispense any treatment and um, beta blockers are sometimes used for pathological tachycardias in cats um, but i would only um, use it if i was happy that there was definitely a pathological tachycardia at present if I had a cat with an inappropriate or persistent sinus tachy with preclinical disease, I would be thinking about hyperthyroidism as well, and I'd want to screen the cat for that too. Any more questions? All right, so I think that's the end. Thanks very much for everybody who attended. I hope that was useful. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us at NIVS and um, my colleagues will be look forward to um, giving you some more presentations in the coming months.